Disc 1, Moving Pictures By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 6x14 Dwarf Sons of the Desert End, Shuffling into the End of the Line A small, hairy and furiously scratching son in a headdress that reached down to his paws. Grab her, become entranced by her beauty, and then throw her over your pommel. Dibbler's voice intruded into his consciousness. Victor desperately reran the half-heard instructions past his mind. My what? he said. It's part of your saddle, Ginger hissed. Oh. And then you ride into the night, with all the suns following you and singing rousing desert bandits songs no one lol hear them, said Saul helpfully. But if they open and shut their mouths it'll help create a, you know, ambience. But it isn't night said Ginger. It's broad daylight. Dibbler stared at her. His mouth opened once or twice. Saul, he shouted. Paint what they do see, never mind what they don't. Dibbler rubbed his nose. I might be prepared to negotiate, he said. The handleman shrugged. You don't understand, Mr. Dibbler. What did they want money for? They'd only eat it. We start telling them to paint what isn't there, we're into all sorts of perhaps it's just a very bright full moon, said Ginger. That's good thinking, said Dibbler. We'll do a card where Victor says to Ginger something like. How bright the moon is tonight, Buana dot. Something like that, said Saul diplomatically. It was noon. Hollywood Hill glistened under the sun like a champagne-flavored wine gum that had been half-sucked. The hand lemon turned their handles, the extras charged enthusiastically backwards and forwards, Dibbler raged at everyone, and cinematographic history was made with a shot of three dwarfs, four men, two trolls and a dog all riding one camel and screaming in terror for it to stop. Victor was introduced to the camel. It blinked its long eyelashes at him and appeared to chew soap. It was kneeling down and it looked like a camel that had had a long morning and wasn't about to take any shit from anyone. So far it had kicked three people. What's it called, he said cautiously. We call it evil-minded son of a bitch, said the newly appointed vice president in charge of camels. That doesn't sound like a name. S a good name for this camel, said the handler fervently. There's nothing wrong with Bane a son of a bitch, said a voice behind him. I'm a son of a bitch. My father was a son of a bitch, you greasy nightshirt weirin' bastard. What happens if you want it to turn? Ah, well, you're on to the advanced manual there. Best thing to do is get off and do it round by hand. When you're ready. Dibbler bellowed through his megaphone. Now. You ride up to the tent, leap off the camel, fight the huge eunuchs, burst into the tent, drag the girl out, get back on the camel and away. Got it? Think you ran do that? What huge eunuchs, said Victor, as the camel unfolded itself upwards. One of the huge eunuchs shyly raised a hand. It's me. Mori, it said. Oh. Hi. Mori. Hi, Vic, and me, Rock, said a second huge eunuch. Hi, Rock. Hi, Vic. Places, everyone, said Dibbler. Wheel. What is it, Rock? Er, I was just wondering, Mr. Dibbler. What is my motivation for this scene? Motivation. Yes. E.R. I got to know, see, said Rock. How about? I'll fire you if you don't do it properly. Rock grinned. Right you are, Mr. Dibbler, he said. Okay, said Dibbler. Everyone ready? Turn M. Evil-minded son of a bitch turned awkwardly, legs flailing at odd camel angles and then lumbered into a complicated trot. The handle turned. 
the air glittered. And Victor awoke. It was like rising slowly out of a pink cloud, or a magnificent dream which, try as you might, drains out of your mind as the daylight shuffles in, leaving a terrible sense of loss, nothing, you know instinctively, nothing you're going to experience for the rest of the day is going to be one half as good as that dream. There was Dibbler. There was Dibbler's nephew. There was the Hondelman. There were the extras. There were the assorted vice presidents and other people who are apparently called into existence by the mere presence of moving picture creation 12 there was Gaspode the Wonder Dog. And everyone, except for the dog, who was sniggering, had his mouth open. The handleman's hand was still turning the handle. He looked down at it as if its presence was new to him, and stopped. Dibbler seemed to come out of whatever trance he was in. Hoo hoo, he said. Blimey. Magic, breathed Saul. Real magic. Dibbler nudged the handleman. Did you get all that, he said. Get what, said Ginger and Victor together. Then Victor noticed Mori sitting on the sand. There was a sizable chip out of his arm, Rock was troweling something into it. The troll noticed Victor's expression and gave him a sickly grin. Think you're Cohen the Barbarian, do you, he said. Yeah, said Rock. There was no call to go callin him what you called him. And if you're going to go doin' fancy sword work, we're applyin' for an extra dollar a day havin' bits chopped off allowance. Victor's sword had several nicks on the blade. For the life of him, he couldn't imagine how they had got there. Look, he said desperately. I don't understand. I didn't call anyone anything. Have we started filming yet? One minute I'm sitting in a tent, next minute I'm breathing camel, said Ginger petulantly. Is it too much to ask what is going on? But no one seemed to be listening to them. Why can't we find a way of getting sound, said Dibbler. That was damn good dialogue there. Didn't understand a word of it, but I know good dialogue when I hear it. What you did? said Rock, was gallop the camel up to the tent, leap off, come at us like a windmill leapin' on rocks and Logan said Mori. Yeah, you said to Mori, have at you, you foul blackguard, said Rock. And then you caught him a right ding on the arm, cut a hole in the tent good sword work, though, said Mori appraisingly. A bit showy, but pretty good. But I don't know how to, Victor began. And she was lying there all long grass, said Rock. And you swept her up, and she said long grass, said Ginger weakly. Langorous, said Victor. I think he means langorous. She said, why, it is the thief of. The thief of. Rock hesitated. Dad's bag, I think you said. Bagged dad, said Mori, rubbing his arm. Yeah, and then she said, you are in great danger, for my father has sworn to kill you, and Victor said but now, O oh fairest rose, I can reveal that I am really the shadow of the desert what's languorous mean, said Ginger suspiciously. And he said, fly with me now to the Caspa, or something like that, and then he gave her this, this. Thing humans do with their lips whistle, said Victor, with hopeless hope. Nah, the other thing. Sounds like a cork coming out of a bottle, said Rock. Kiss, said Ginger, coldly. Yeah. Not that I'm any judge, said Rock, but it seemed to go on for a while. Definitely very, you know, kissy. I thought it was going to be bucket of water time myself, said a quiet canine voice behind Victor. He kicked out backwards, but failed to connect. And then he was back on the camel and dragged her up and Mr. Dibbler shouted a heavy hand settled on Victor's shoulder. He turned, and saw the shape of detritus eclipsing the world. Mr. Dibbler doesn't want anyone running off, 
he said. Everyone has to stay until Mr. Dibbler says. You're a real pain, you know, said Victor. Detritus gave him a big, gem-studded grin. Thirteen Mr. Dibbler says I can be a vice president, he said proudly. In charge of what, said Victor. Vice presidents, said Detritus. Gaspode the Wonder Dog made a little growling sound at the back of his throat. The camel, which had been idly staring at the sky, sidled around a bit and suddenly lashed out with a kick that caught the troll in the small of the back. Detritus yelped. Gaspode gave the world a look of satisfied innocence. Come on, said Victor grimly. While he's trying to find something to hit the camel with. They sat down in the shade behind the tent. I just want you to know, said Ginger coldly, that I have never attempted to look languorous in my life. Could be worth a try, said Victor, absently. What? Sorry. Look, something made us act like that. I don't know how to use a sword. I've always just waved it around. What did you feel like? You know how you feel when you hear someone say something and you realize you've been daydreaming. It was like your own life fading away and something else filling up the space. They considered this in silence. Do you think it's something to do with holy wood, she said. A talking dog sounds pretty dangerous to me, said Victor. Dreadfully, said Ginger. You never know what it might say. See. See, said Gaspode mournfully. I knew it'd be nothing but trouble, showin' I can talk. It shouldn't happen to a dog. But it's going to, said Victor. Oh, all right. All right. For what good it'll do, muttered Gaspode. Victor relaxed. The dog sat up and shook sand off himself. You won't understand it, anyway he grumbled. Another dog would understand, but you won't. It's down to species experience, see. Like kissing. You know what it's like, but I don't. It's not a canine experience. He noticed the warning look in Victor's eyes, and plunged on, it's the way you look as if you belong here. He watched them for a moment. See. See, he said. I told you you wouldn't understand. It's... It's territory, see? You got all the signs of Bane right where you should be. Nearly everyone else here is a stranger, but you aren't. E.R. Like, you muse have noticed where some dogs bark at you when you're new to a place? It's not you smell, we got this amazing sense of displacement. Like... Some humans get uncomfortable when they see a picture hung crooked. It's like that, only worse. It's kind of like the only place you ought to be now is here. He looked at them again, and then industriously scratched an ear. What the hell, he said. The trouble is, I can explain it in dog but you only listen in human. It sounds a bit mystical to me, said Ginger. You said something about my eyes, said Victor. Yeah, well. Have you looked at your own eyes? Gaspode nodded at Ginger. You too, miss. Don't be daft, said Victor. How can we look at our own eyes? Gaspode shrugged. You could look at each other's, he suggested. They automatically turned to face each other. There was a long drawn out moment. Gaspode employed it to urinate noisily against a tent peg. The sort of sparkle. A shadow fell across the sand. Ah, there you are, said Dibbler. He put his arms around their shoulders as they stood up, and gave them a sort of hug. You young people, always going off alone together, he said archly. Great business. Great business. Very romantic. But we've got a click to make, and I've got lots of people standing around waiting for you, so let's do it. 
See what I mean, muttered Gaspode, very quietly. When you knew what you were looking for, you couldn't miss it. In the center of both of Dibler's eyes was a tiny golden star. In the heartlands of the great dark continent of Clatch the air was heavy and pregnant with the promise of the coming monsoon. Bullfrogs croaked in the rushes fourteen by the slow brown river. Crocodiles dozed on the mudflats. Nature was holding its breath. A cooing broke out in the pigeon loft of Azurel Enchote, stock dealer. He stopped dozing on the veranda, and went over to see what had caused the excitement. In the vast pens behind the shack a few threadbare bewilder beasts, marked down for a quick sale, yawning and cutting in the heat, looked up in alarm as Enchote leapt the veranda steps in one bound and tore towards them. He rounded the zebra pens and homed in on his assistant Ambuletin, who was peacefully mucking out the ostriches. How many he stopped, and began to wheeze. Ambuletin, who was twelve years old, dropped his shovel and patted him heavily on the back. How many he tried again. You been overdoing it again, boss, said Ambuletin in a concerned voice. How many elephants we got. Jing Camp probably going cheap, call it two dozen someone want a lot of elephants, boss. Was saying there's a herd over Tietze way, shouldn't be a problem, then there's all the valleys over towards Mbuletin leaned on the fence and waited. Maybe two hundred, give or take ten, said Azurel, throwing down the stick. Nowhere near enough. You can't give or take ten elephants, boss said Mbuletin firmly. He knew that counting elephants was a precision job. A man might be uncertain about how many wives he had, but never about elephants. Either you had one, or you didn't. Our agent in Clatch has an order for, as Earl swallowed, a thousand elephants. A thousand? Immediately. Cash on delivery. As Earl let the paper drop to the ground. To a place called Ankh-Morpork, he said despondently. He sighed. It would have been nice, he said. Mbuletin scratched his head and stared at the hammerhead clouds massing over MTF Twangy. Soon the dry veld would boom to the thunder of the rains. Then he reached down and picked up the stick. What are you doing, said Azurel. Drawing a map, boss, said Mbuletin. Azurel shook his head. Not worth it, boy. Three thousand miles to Ankh, I reckon, I let myself get carried away. Too many miles, not enough elephants. We could go across the plains, boss, said Mbuletin. Lot of elephants on the plains. Send messengers ahead. We could pick up plenty more elephants on the way, no problem. That whole plain just about covered in damn elephants. No, we'd have to go around on the coast, said the dealer, drawing a long curving line in the sand. The reason being, there's the jungle just Mbuletin took the stick, indicated the jungle, and grinned. I know where there's a lot of prime timber just been uprooted, boss, he said. Yeah. Okay, boy but we've still got to get it into the mountains. It just so happened that a Tihus and real strong elephants will be going that way, boss. Mbuletin grinned again. His tribe went in for sharpening their teeth to points fifteen he handed back the stick. Azurel's mouth opened slowly. By the seven moons of Nasrim, he breathed. We could do it, you know. It's only, oh. Thirteen or fourteen hundred miles that way. Maybe less, even. Yet. Yeah. We could really do it. Yes, boss. You know, I've always wanted to do something big with my life. Something real, said Azurel. I mean, an ostrich here, a giraffe there. It's not the sort of thing you get remembered for. He stared at the purple-gray horizon. We could do it, couldn't we, he said. Sure, boss. Right over the mountains. 
Sure, boss. If you looked really hard, you could just see that the purple-gray was topped with white. They're pretty high mountains, said Azurel, his voice now edged with doubt. Slope go up, slope go down, said Mbuletin nomically. That's true, said Azurel. Like, on average, it's flat all the way. He gazed at the mountains again. A thousand elephants, he muttered. Do you know, boy, when they built the tomb of King Leonid of Ephib they used a hundred elephants to order. And some things didn't he have to happen at all. He saw the artist draw one card which said in the king's palace, one hour litra. One hour of time had been vanished, just like that. Of course, he knew that it hadn't really been surgically removed from his life. It was the sort of thing that happened all the time in books. And on the stage, too. He'd seen a group of strolling players once, and the performance had leapt magically from a battlefield in sort to the Ephibian fortress, that night with no more than a brief descent of the sackcloth curtain and a lot of muffled bumping and cursing as the scenery was changed. But this was different. Ten minutes after doing a scene, you'd do another scene that was taking place the day before, somewhere else, because Dibbler had rented the tents for both scenes and didn't want to have to pay any more rent than necessary. You just had to try and forget about everything but now, and that was hard when you were also waiting every moment for that fading sensation. It didn't come. Just after another half-hearted fight scene Dibbler announced that it was all finished. Aren't we going to do the ending, said Ginger. You did that this morning, said Saul. Oh. There was a chattering noise as the demons were let out of their box and sat swinging their little legs on the edge of the lid and passing a tiny cigarette from hand to hand. The extras queued up for their wages. The camel kicked the vice president in charge of camels. The hand lemon wound the great reels of film out of the boxes and went away to whatever arcane cutting and gluing the hand lemon got up to in the hours of darkness. MRS Cosmopolite Vice President in charge of wardrobe, gathered up the costumes and toddled off, possibly to put them back on the beds. A few acres of scrubby backlet stopped being the rolling dunes of the Great Neff and went back to being scrubby backlet again. Victor felt that much the same thing was happening to him. Months ago. There weren't any. They strolled aimlessly towards the town. What did you want to be, he ventured. She shrugged. I didn't know. I just knew I didn't want to be a milkmaid. There had been milkmaids at home. Victor tried to recollect anything about them. It always looked quite an interesting job to me, milkmaiding, he said vaguely. Buttercups, you know. And fresh air. It's cold and wet and just as you've finished the bloody cow kicks the bucket over. Don't tell me about milking. Or being a shepherdess. Or a goose girl. I really hated our farm. Oh. And they expected me to marry my cousin when I was fifteen. Is that allowed? Oh, yes. Everyone marries their cousins where I come from. Why, said Victor. I suppose it saves having to worry about what to do on Saturday nights. Oh. Didn't you want to be anything, said Ginger, putting a whole sentence worth of disdain in a mere three letters. Not really, said Victor. Everything looks interesting until you do it. Then you find it's just another job. I bet even people like Cohen the Barbarian get up in the morning thinking, oh, no, not another day of crushing the jeweled thrones of the world beneath my sandaled feet. Is that what he does? said Ginger, interested despite herself. According to the stories, yes. Why? Search me. It's just a job, I guess. She threw the shells towards the sunset and laughed. I'm going to be the most famous person in the world, everyone will fall in love with me, and I shall live forever. It's always best to know your own mind, said Victor diplomatically. 
You know what the greatest tragedy is in the whole world, said Ginger, not paying him the least attention. It's all the people who never find out what it is they really want to do or what it is they're really good at. It's all the sons who become blacksmiths because their fathers were blacksmiths. It's all the people who could be really fantastic flute players who grow old and die without ever seeing a musical instrument, so they become bad pluff men instead. It's all the people with talents who never even find out. Maybe they are never even born in a time when it's even possible to find out. She took a deep breath. It's all the people who never get to know what it is they can really be. It's all the wasted chances. Well, Hollywood is my chance, do you understand? This is my time for getting. Victor nodded. Yes, he said. Magic for ordinary people, Silverfish had called it. A man turned a handle, and your life got changed. And not just for me, Ginger went on. It's a chance for all of us. The people who aren't wizards and kings and heroes. Hollywood's like a big bubbling stew but this time different ingredients float to the top. Suddenly there's all these new things for people to do. Do you know the theaters don't allow women to act? But Hollywood does. And in Hollywood there's jobs for trolls that don't just involve hitting people. And what did the hand lemon do before they had handles to turn? She waved a hand vaguely in the direction of Ankh Morpork's distant glow. Now they're trying to find ways of adding sound to moving pictures, she said, and out there are people who'll turn out to be amazingly good at making, making, making sound dice. They don't even know it yet but they're out there. I can feel them. They're out there. Look at wizards, Ginger went on, vibrating with indignation. What good has their magic ever done anyone? I think it sort of holds the world together Victor began. They're pretty good at magic flames and things, but can they make a loaf of bread? Ginger wasn't in the mood for listening to anyone. Not for very long, said Victor helplessly. What does that mean? Something real like a loaf of bread contains a lot of... Well, I suppose you'd call it energy, said Victor. It takes a massive amount of power to create that amount of energy. You'd have to be a pretty good wizard to make a loaf that'd last in this world for more than a tiny part of a second. But that's not what magic is really about, you see, he added quickly. Because this world is who cares, said Ginger. Hollywood's really doing things for ordinary people. Silver screen magic. What's come over you? Last night that was then, said Ginger impatiently. Don't you see? We could be going somewhere. We could be becoming someone. Because of Hollywood. The world is our lobster, said Victor. She waved a hand irritably. Any shellfish you like, she said. I was thinking of oysters, actually. Were you? I was thinking of lobsters. Bursar. I shouldn't have to run around like this at my age, thought the bursar, scurrying down the corridor in answer to the Archchancellor's bellow. Why is he so interested in the damn thing, anyway? Wretched pot. Coming, master, he trilled. The Archchancellor's desk was covered with ancient documents. When a wizard died, all his papers were stored in one of the outlying reaches of the library. Shelf after shelf of quietly moldering documents, the haunt of mysterious beetles and dry rot, stretched away into an unguisable distance. Iryon kept telling everyone that there was a wealth look at this, said the Archchancellor. Star enumerator. Rev counter for use in ecclesiastical areas. Swamp meter. Swamp meter. The man was mad. He had a very tidy mind, said the bursar. Same thing. Is it, er, really important, Archchancellor, the bursar ventured. Damn thing shot pellets at me, said Oli. 
twice. I'm sure it wasn't, er, intended I want to see how it was made, man. Just think of the sport and possibilities. The bursar tried to think of the possibilities. I'm sure Richter didn't intend to make any kind of offensive device, he ventured, hopelessly. Who gives a damn what he intended? Where is the thing now? I had a couple of servants put sandbags around it. Good idea. It's... Oh, um. Oh, um. It was a muffled sound from the corridor. The two wizards exchanged a meaningful glance. Oh, um. Oh, um, w -h -u -m -m. The bursar held his breath. Plib. 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 The Arch-Chancellor peered at the hourglass on the mantelpiece. It's doing it every five minutes now, he said. And it's up to three shots, said the bursar. I'll have to order some more sandbags. He flicked through a heap of paper. A word caught his eye. Reality. Beach. And below the surface, the lobsters walked backwards along the deep, drowned streets. Victor threw another piece of driftwood onto the fire. It burned blue with salt. I don't understand her, he said. Yesterday she was quite normal, today it's all gone to her head. Bitches, said Gaspode, sympathetically. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, said Victor. She's just aloof. Loofs, said Gaspode. That's what intelligence does for your sex life, said Don T. Call me Merthumpy. Rabbits never have that sort of trouble. Go, so, thank you Do. You could try offering her a mouche, said the cat. Present company excepted, of course, it added guiltily, trying to avoid definitely not squeaks glare. Being intelligent hasn't done my social life any favors, either said Mr. Thumpy bitterly. A week ago, no problems. Now suddenly I want to make conversation, and all they do is sit there wrinkling their noses at you. You feel a right idiot. There was a strangulated quacking. The duck says, Have you done anything about the book? said Gaspode. I had a look at it when we broke for lunch, said Victor. There was another irritable quack. The duck says, yes, but what have you done about it, said Gaspode. Look, I can't go all the way to Ankh-Morpork just like that, snapped Victor. It takes hours. We film all day as it is. Ask for a day off, said Mr. Thumpy. No one asks for a day off in Hollywood, said Victor. I've been fired once, thank you shaped like a small hillock. He had to face up to it. Detritus was in love. Yes, he'd spent many years in Ankh-Morpork hitting people for money. Yes, it had been a friendless, brutalizing life. And a lonely one, too. He'd been resigned to an old age of bitter bachelorhood and suddenly, now, Hollywood was handing him a chance he'd never dreamed of. He'd been strictly brought up and he could dimly remember the lecture he'd been given by his father when he was a young troll. If you saw a girl you liked, you didn't just rush at her. There were proper ways to go about things. He'd gone down to the beach and found a rock. But not any old rock. He'd searched carefully, and found a large sea-smoothed one with veins of pink and white quartz. Girls liked that sort of thing. Now he waited, shyly, for her to finish work. He tried to think of what he would say. No one had ever told him what to say. It wasn't as if he was a smart troll like Rock or Mori, who had a way with words. Basically, he'd never needed much of what you might call a vocabulary. He kicked despondently at the sand. What chance did he have with a smart lady like her? There was a thump of heavy feet and the door opened. The object of desire stepped out into the night and took a deep breath, which had the same effect on detritus as an ice cube down the neck. 
he gave his rock a panicky look. It didn't seem anything like big enough now, when you saw the size of her. But maybe it was what you did with it that mattered. Well, this was it. They said you never forgot your first time. He wound up his arm with the rock in it and hit her squarely between the eyes. That's when it all started to go wrong. Tradition said that the girl, when she was able to focus again, and if the rock was of an acceptable standard, should immediately be amenable to whatever the troll suggested, i.e., a candle-lit human for two, although of course that sort of thing wasn't done anymore now, at least if there was any chance of being caught. Date A rock on the head may be quite sentimental, she went on, the certainty draining out of her voice as she surveyed the sentence ahead of her, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. She hesitated. That didn't sound right, even to her. It certainly puzzled detritus. What? You want I should knock my teeth out, he said. Well, all right, not diamonds, Ruby conceded. But they're proper modern ways now. You got to court a girl. Detritus brightened. Ah, but I he began. That's court, not caught said Ruby wearily. You got to, to, to she paused. She wasn't all that sure what you had to do. But Ruby had spent some weeks in Hollywood, and if Hollywood did anything, it changed things, in Hollywood she'd plugged into a vast cross-species female Freemasonry she hadn't suspected existed, and she was learning fast. She'd talked at length to sympathetic human girls. And dwarfs. Even dwarfs had better courtship rituals, for God's sake 16 and what humans got up to was amazing. Whereas all a female troll had to look forward to was a quick thump on the head and the rest of her life subduing and cooking anything the male dragged back to the cave. Well, there were going to be changes. Next time Ruby went home the troll mountains were going to receive their biggest shake-up since the last continental collision. In the meantime, she was going to start with her own life. She waved a massive hand in a vague way. You got to, to sing outside a girl's window, she said, and, and you got to give her oa grat. Oa grat. Yet. Yeah. Pretty oa grat. Seventeen hammering filled the air. Buildings were spreading backwards from the nameless main street into the dunes. No one owned any land in Hollywood. If it was empty, you built on it. Dibbler had two offices now. There was one where he shouted at people, and a bigger one just outside it where people shouted at each other. Saul shouted at Hand Lemon. Hand Lemon shouted at alchemists. Demons wandered over every flat surface and drowned in the coffee cups and shouted at one another. A couple of experimental green parrots shouted at themselves. People wearing odd bits of costume wandered in and just shouted. Silverfish shouted because he couldn't quite work out why he now had a desk in the outer office even though he owned the studio. Gaspode sat stolidly by the door to the inner office. In the past five minutes he had attracted one half-hearted kick, a soggy biscuit and a pat on the head. He reckoned he was ahead of the game, dog-wise. He was trying to listen to all the conversations at once. It was extremely instructive. For one thing, some of the people coming in and shouting were carrying bags of money. You what? The shout had come from the inner office. Gaspode cocked the other ear. I, E.R., want a day off, Mr. Dibbler, said Victor. A day off. You don't want to work. Just for the day, Mr. Dibbler. But you don't think I'm going to go around paying people to have days off, do you? I'm not trade of money, you know. It's not as if we make a profit, even. Hold a crossbow to my head, why don't you? Gaspode looked at the bags in front of Saul, who was furiously adding up piles of coins. He raised a cynical eyebrow. There was a pause. Oh, no, thought Gaspode. 
The Young Idiots Forgetting His Lines. Audiobook generated by, Read With The Ears.